the uh, show went off really well last night. It seemed like you're having a little bit of trouble with the sound, though. Um, I have trouble with my voice. <laughs> the last time my voice went out on me yesterday. Um, I thought I had a lot of energy. You know, we. I don't. I, a lot of people said it sounded pretty good out in front of the house. On stage, it sounded sounded okay. With the monitors weren't loud enough, but that's we're used to that. But I thought I thought the energy was very good last night. I thought, you know, technically, I wish I had sung better, but you have to make up for it in other ways. So I thought we played. I thought musically we played really well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just been over the years. You know, it's a it's an ongoing thing. I've had a lot of a lot of voice problems in the last probably in the last three years. Mm -hmm. It's been getting worse. Is that right? Yeah. That's not a good sign. No, it's not. Uh -huh. So it's it's it makes it really hard. It. <clears throat> I never know when it's going to happen. You know, it's just some nights, you know, I'll start singing and something will snap. Is that right? Yeah, I've, uh, it's it's like a chronic problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just, you, you just go up there and you hope that it's not going to happen. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'm eventually gonna have, going to have to cut back a little bit on the live, you know, on the amount of touring that we're doing just because of that. It's, it's, I don't like going up there when that happens, you know, and putting on less than what I think is the best show. I'd rather not play, you know, so. You would imagine, though, that that would be a hard modification to make, i.e. cutting back on touring because <clears throat> sugar is being received so well in some of the different countries. I know. So actually, you've come to the point where you have to spread yourself a little bit thinner, if anything. Yeah, I know. I mean, we're, you know, we're aware of that. The, you know, the road... You know, and touring always takes a toll on you. There's, you know, there's always a lot of press and a lot of obligations beyond the show, especially, you know, since this is our first time to Japan, we've been really busy. Um, well, you know, we have a philosophy as well about touring. I, You know, we look at bands like Pearl Jam or Faith No More, or people like that, that just stay on the road for two or three years at a time, and then they have nothing left. And they just it explodes. They break up, and it's all over. Um, you know, we would prefer not to do that. <laughs> you know, I think touring a little bit less and making it a little more special and making it something to really look forward to, as opposed to just a routine where it's year after year. Um, I mean, I've been on the road for four, 13 years. You know, it's it gets a lot harder. You know, I'm. Th feel some days I feel like I'm 32 going on 60 you know just it's uh, it's it's a hard way to it's a hard way to make a living I guess Unless you yeah and, and that's what we try to do is, is try to keep a good balance we you know not too much to where we get sick of them mm -hmm. well, you, there was um, uh, a couple of year, years ago had you imagined that you would now be in Japan and talking to people like us for the first time, how did you envision this sort of success? Um, well, with, you know, with the previous work that I've done, both with Husker Du and the solo work, there was very limited interest in Japan, you know, for, for you know, for live performances. I think with Sugar and, uh, you know, now working with, with Denon here, you know, through the uh, you know, I think just having somebody that's releasing the records domestically in Japan, it's made you know it's made the opportunity a lot, a lot clearer. That was case no, was that right? no, it was always imports, and uh, you know, Ryko, the parent company in America, did the licensing deal with Denon, and I think you know there's been a lot there was a lot of interest generated. I think it seems like here people because it was number one on the CMJ alternative charts. And because in England it was doing very well, those are I think the barometers that they use for sort of judging whether things are, you know, things are going to be popular here. And since we did well on both of those fronts this year, that uh, you know the opportunity came up. You know, we'd like to. You know, we're we're having a great time. You know, we'd like to make this a regular, you know, a regular thing to try to keep coming back as often as possible.
didn't know the pronunciation was Husker Du. Husker Du, yeah. I thought it was Husker. Oh, Husker Du. So, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there. I think there was a very, you know, there was real underground interest in all the things I've done before, but not, mm -hmm. you know, this record has obviously taken off a lot more than those things have, so. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I learned about Husker. Um, always sort of a favorite on the college charts. Um, but only last a year on Warner's. Uh, was that uh, a bitter experience for you? Um, no, I, I just think in 1985 and 1986 when Husker Du went to Warner Brothers, there was no, there was no precedent for a band with that style of music on a major label. And I think they were sort of confused as to what to do with it. I mean, at a company as large as Warner Brothers in America, they have a separate alternative department, which has become a big deal now. But in 1986, they really didn't know what, uh, what they could do, you know. Uh, so, you know, we were very popular with the people in the alternative department at the company, but to try to go to the commercial radio department or, you know, to, to, to transcend beyond what we had already done, you know, they weren't really receptive. The, you know, the, the, you know the, the AOR people or the, ro the regular rock radio programming people, they didn't understand it. They just like, this is never going to get played. Is that right? Yeah, so it wasn't a bitter experience. It was just uh, it was a learning experience, you know. That well, that's interesting because what you suggest is that if, if a, a, a guy, A and R guy, or a guy in charge of promotion doesn't like your stuff or thinks it's just not here for radio, the buck stops there. Exactly. Gets yep. that exactly. Huh. Yep. <coughs> well, I told you. I, you I, I think an example would be at Warner Brothers, Husker Du was not nearly as important as how many Madonna records they could sell next time or how many Van Halen records they could sell whereas now Sugar on Ryko Disc is the most important thing uh -huh. you know so we get all the attention oh, of I the see. company right, right. you know and just having that kind of support makes all the difference I mean that's why this record has been so successful because it is the number one priority yeah. for both Ryko and creation in Europe you know you go out who's going to do not unlike the Dead Kennedys, sort of a cult hero kind of outfit. Mm -hmm. um, however, after the band folded, uh, there were rumors being banded about that you had lost quite a bit of money and or you were in debt uh, quite a bit and you had a lot of money to pay back. Mm, no, not with Husker Du. Mm -hmm. No, that was always that was always fine. That that situation <laughs> came about after the two solo records that I did with Virgin America. Um, I had gotten caught up in a lot of bad... Uh, I basically just had hired on a management company to take care of my stuff and uh, learned an even more valuable lesson <laughs> about the music business. Um, Which is? Uh, just really, you have to, if you want anything done right, you have to do it yourself. Well, the bigger management companies uh, in America, you know, they get paid on a commission, so they, they'll they do all kinds of things to get more money in for the short term, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's merchandising deals or publishing deals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I am not a big fan of owing anyone any money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got, you know, I was, a lot, you know, I allowed myself to be put in a bad position, both so, with all, you know, with different things like that. Excuse me, but when you say commission, you mean the artist has to pay the management company commission. Oh, all the money goes to them first. They take a commission and then the rest is usually spent paying lawyers bills and uh -huh. travel costs and things like that. Yeah, so they were taking your money then and... and Spending it for me. <laughs> <laughs> On expenses they had incurred. Uh -huh. So you weren't just... It was a matter of you're not getting your money. No, I didn't get any money. Uh -huh. I didn't get any money and was in... You know, and was... Put into you know put into contractual positions that I had a hard time getting out of after the fact, and that's where a lot of the, you know, to to start over, I had to buy my way out of a lot of contracts. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's where the yeah that that was in the ni that was in the end of 1990, after the second solo album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were put in a very compromising position, as you said, to have to buy your way out of the various contractual obligations you had and 
uh, Mr. Saito was noting here, a lot of people would just sort of fall by the wayside at that point. Mm -hmm. But you obviously 